Welcome back to Morning Glory. It's three minutes past eight. I'm Mike Graham, and the day is upon us, and we've got plenty to do. Uh, normally speaking, it would be the biggest budget day of all time, because it's the first time, apparently, that a woman, according to Keir Starmer, uh, as far as he knows, anyway, uh, is producing a budget. Uh, it's the first time the Labour Party have done it for 14 years. And, of course, we all remember when the Tories took over from Labour uh, 14 years ago. Uh, the money situation wasn't great. Um, I'm delighted to say uh, that here uh, in the studio with us, Liz Truss is here, former Prime Minister. Welcome. Hello. Good Very nice to see you. It's budget day, uh, normally a big day for, for everybody, I guess, in, in Westminster. Um, let's kick things off straight away on that. I mean, this has been probably the most telegraphed budget of all time. I mean, um, we've got Lindsay Hoyle shouting in the Commons yesterday about people going around the world and telling everybody else what's going on and not actually delivering uh, in, the, in the chamber itself. Um, but the Labour Party and the Labour government seem to be hell-bent on just annoying everyone and making statements and making judgments on, on things which are all completely against what the British people want. Well, the problem is the, the economic situation was already bad. Mm. We had the highest taxes for 70 years. The government is spending almost half of the national income. The civil service has ballooned yeah. in size. And we were already in a situation, this is what I tried to stop back in 2022, of taxes were going higher and higher, businesses were closing down, people are leaving the country, we've got the highest rate of millionaires leaving the country mm. of any country in the world. And what Labour seem hell-bent on doing is making it even worse. Yeah. So putting the taxes up by 35 billion, making the net zero rules so tough that it kills business yeah. because they can't get cheap energy. And we've seen the steel industry go under, we're seeing refineries go under, and I fear this is just the start of the pain. Mm. You know, it's going to be a very painful day, but what will happen is because the taxes are going so high, it will stop businesses investing in this country. Yeah. And what we'll find is next year, Labour want to come back for more. And that is really frightening for our country. Because they just want to keep feeding the beast, don't they? Because they keep saying there's no money, there's a £22 billion black hole, suddenly it becomes a £40 billion black hole, and yet they then continue to spend money where they want to spend it. For example, giving pay, public sector pay rises, you know, the net zero uh, yeah. uh, commitments, as you say. Um, and it's going back to the 70s, it seems to me. I mean, I'm yeah. old enough to remember the 70s, unfortunately. But the and difference is, in the 70s, we had very powerful unions and an inefficient manufacturing mm. sector. Now we have a very powerful bureaucracy, and they are in charge. Yeah. The Bank of England, the Office of Budget Responsibility, I know, I've been there. These are the people dictating the policy. And until we actually wrest control away from those bureaucrats and start holding politicians to account, we're not going to fix any of these problems because all they want to do is they want to increase their power. Right. And that means that if you're a small businessman trying to employ people, you get raided just to feed the ever-growing public sector. And that Labour and public sector people, you know, Rachel Rees worked for the Bank of England. We don't know exactly what job she did. Well, she made she the did. tea by the sound she, of it, she? But she did work there. Yeah. You know, she is part of them. But it's not as an economist, though, which you are. Well, exactly. But right. she, she is part of that bureaucratic mindset. Keir Starmer is part of the, you know, the D, former DPP, part of that bureaucratic mindset. They cannot think beyond feeding the public mm. sector and we are killing we are killing our economy i mean we now have the most expensive energy prices in the entire developed world mm. how on earth can you run a manufacturing business and in this country up. when when your energy prices are four times the energy prices in the united states and what we're not hearing about from labor is things like fracking yeah you know, this is what we need to actually get our economy going cheap energy low costs make it easy to employ people. They're doing the opposite. Mm. They're making it harder to employ people. They're pushing up the energy costs with net zero, and they are making it very, very difficult to go out to work and run a business in yes. this country. And they said they weren't going to hit workers. Mm. What we've heard so far of all the leaks from the budget is £20 billion is going to be on employers' national insurance. Yeah. I mean, who do they think are doing those jobs? Exactly I right. I thought they were workers. And also the minimum wage business as well. I was talking to a restaurant earlier the other day who said, look, um, I don't get paid that much money myself. I run the business. I, I probably take home about, you know, after tax, 25,000 quid. He said, I'm going to be giving people more money than that who work for me uh, because of government regulations and I'm going to have to contribute more national insurance on their behalf. So in a way, it's probably not worth me keeping the restaurant open. I might just shut it. And those are the kind of conversations people are having. 
It's it's very very depressing, mm. and we are we are now in an economic doom loop, and my fear is that we are going to end up where we did in the 70s. Yeah, the country that's what I will think. run out of money. We will end up having to go to the IMF for yeah. a bailout. That is how bad. Just like it Dennis is. Healy did. Just who famously said, by the way, that uh, the, the the job of chancellor is not something a woman should do. Do you remember that? Well, he wasn't particularly great either, He wasn't, was he? no, he was hopeless. <laughs> no, shortly after he said it, shortly after he said it, he went begging to the IMF. I think, but, I mean, I think we've got equal opportunities for m women and men to be bad chancellors. Yes. That's what we have. Well, I don't and think Rachel Reeves... Rachel Reeves is a terrible chancellor. Yeah. So was Dennis Healy. Right, it doesn't matter whether she's a woman, though, but Keir Starmer was making this out to be, like, the greatest, uh, you know, sort of discovery of the but age. This is the problem with, with the Labour Party. They're obsessed with identity politics. Yeah. They're obsessed with... Are you a woman? Are you a man? Are you black? Right. This is not what drives Britain forward. Mm. What we should care about is people's talents, their ability to get things done. And that is irrelevant in the modern Labour mm. Party. They throw money at the, at the areas where there is no prospect of any economic growth. Yeah. You've talked before about a kind of a, a mystery blob that exists behind the scenes where everything's run by civil servants, the Bank of England, that kind of thing. Jeremy Hunt the other day said that the OBR was biased. I mean, yeah, I, better I, I, late than never from Jeremy well, Hunt. Yeah, I mean, better late than never. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, guys, I thought he was part of all of that. But I mean, what is the point of the, of the Office of Budget Responsibility now? Well, what what happened, and this was under Osborne, but Blair also outsourced mm. a lot of power. Is it was out the power to forecast what taxes will do, what spending will do, was outsourced to the Office of Budget Responsibility, which means. There is no room for political judgment about what a ta what is going to happen when you raise taxes. I believe, for example, that raising corporation tax to 25% was a massive mistake mm. because all that's happened is companies have left Britain, less money has come in. But the Office of Budget Responsibility didn't agree with that and they had the power, not me. So I was not able to change what we were forecasting the Office of Budget Responsibility was making those decisions. And if politicians aren't making the decisions, and instead they're being made by faceless bureaucrats mm. no one's heard of, the public are going to say, what's the point of voting yeah, for you? Right. Because you're just going in office, you're taking dictation from these people, and this is what is happening to Rachel Reeves. They are saying this is the amount of money this will raise, this is the amount of money that will raise. They are saying that if you do things like fracking, it's not actually going to bring any income into the country, therefore mm. we're not going to score it on our scorecard. And it limits the room for manoeuvre of politicians. I think it's been a disaster. Ever since the Office of Budget Responsibility came into being, the Britain's, Britain's national debt has grown exponentially. Yeah. So, and what do you make so of this? So what, what, what have they succeeded in doing? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. But also, what have you made of this ridiculous notion that we can take the debt and just call it something different and then it's no longer debt? I mean, I said it's a bit like me going down to the, the bank and saying, that mortgage I've got, can you just call it something else? I'm not going to give you any money it's for just, that. It's, give absolute, me some more money. it's absolute nonsense. Yeah. It's totally irresponsible. And ultimately, the government will be caught out. The fact that the OBR is going along with all this tells you what you need to know. Yeah. Because whenever you hire somebody in the government, what do they want? They want more government. They want more power. They want a bigger budget and they want to hire more people. Yeah. So she's now opening an office of value for money. What are those people going to do? I know. Those people are going to hire more people and much more... in the office of value yeah. for money. And then they are going to try and expand their empire. And they're not going to improve value for money they're going to make it no. worse well they're going to make it more expensive as well which yeah. is sort of counterintuitive isn't it let's talk about southport because this story broke late yesterday uh, we may have questions about why it broke late yesterday because it may be that the government didn't particularly want anybody to do anything with it which they, they got that wrong as well it was on the front pages of all the papers you were prime minister is it possible in any way shape or form that keir starmer didn't know about these facts about the suspects in southport at the time um, when, say, Yvette Cooper, the day after, was making a lot of noise about misinformation and, and the dangers of people saying things. I would find it extraordinary that he did not know what was going on. If you think these materials were found in the suspect's house, yeah. that must have happened fairly soon after the appalling, the appalling atrocity yeah. that took place in Southport. So I find it extraordinary that he wouldn't know those things and it seems that the public has not been 
you know, not being told the truth no. about what happened. And, you know, the whole narrative that has been allowed to develop that somehow Britain has a problem with the far right, yeah. but we don't have a problem with Islamist terrorism, yeah. is... The public don't believe it. No, of course they you know, don't. People know that's not true. Right. And it erodes trust in politics. It erodes trust in the machinery of government because it's not just the politicians we're talking about here. It is the police. Yeah. It is the, the CPS it is the intelligence well. services. Mm. It is the it is the CPS. But it seems extraordinary that it should only come out now. Yeah. And who would make that decision? I mean, would it be, say, for example, in your role as the Prime Minister, would the, would the, would the head of the, would the DPP uh, come into you and say, I don't think we should let this information go to, to the public? Or would it come from um, higher up? Would it be Keir Starmer saying to the DPP, I don't think we should let this information out? How does that work? I mean, my the main dealings I had was with you know, overseas intelligence right. and what happened and what would be released. And it would be something that would be agreed but something like that that mm. is so explosive, one would assume it would go up to prime ministerial level yeah. and ultimately they would have that authority. And it would be agreed with the security services, it would be agreed with the police. But this extraordinary gap of mm. three months yes. in terms of telling people what, what had gone on, mm. it seems... It's very odd, isn't it? It, it seems odd, and if it's not sinister, Keir Starmer needs to say what happened now. You're right. You know, he but, needs to tell people what what happened. Yes, and also we still get people asking the question about the other uh, CPS problem, which is the Manchester airport attack, which has now been three months or, or more uh, since that happened, where everybody saw very clearly police officers being assaulted, um, seriously assaulted. Uh, one of them, I think, got a broken nose. The two uh, uh, men involved in that have still yet to be charged. The CPS is still considering what to do. Mm. And you have to wonder whether that's a similar s situation. And, and you have to ask the question, is the CPS now fit for purpose? Is it, is it I mean, now we... so politicised that it can't do its job? I think we have a very serious accountability problem in the criminal justice system. This date r dates right back to Tony Blair's government, mm. where, again, a lot of responsibility that used to lie in the hands of politicians was outsourced. The, the decisions for appointing the senior judiciary used to be made by the Lord Chancellor. They were then outsourced to a quango. Mm. So what has been created in the British state is a myriad of all these different organisations. And too often, Nobody knows who's actually responsible for what. Right. They're unaccountable, they're very opaque, and these kind of answers like, we are still working on mm. it, can be passed around the system for months, and it does not work. No. And it, every aspect now of British life, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's immigration, where we have similar problems, whether it's the economy, where you've got the, the problems of the Office of, Bank, Office of Budget Responsibility and the Bank of England, or whether it's climate change, where it's all outsourced to the Climate Change Committee, yeah. who are deciding the carbon budgets that we've all got to live our lives by. It, all of those things yeah. are outside political governance and that is and i think that's partly why people have lost faith in politicians because Correct. they don't see them having any influence really necessarily apart from a bad influence that that is basically correct yeah and the conservative party of course have been kind of in what you might call kind of treading water um facilities for the i think this leadership months. election has certainly gone on for far it too really long. has but i mean does it matter who becomes the next leader on saturday I think the most important thing is the Conservative Party recognise what went wrong for the last 14 years. And I have not heard enough discussion about that. The fact is that we were in power for 14 years, yet all of the problems we've just been talking about, the criminal justice system, the economy, we did not reverse what Tony Blair had done. Mm. We left in the Tony Blair institutions, which had been captured by the left, They've been captured by left-wing ideology, whether it's the climate change zealots, whether it's the human rights obsessives, whether it's the woke wokery. They captured the institutions and we did not change that. So we ended up in a situation, leaving office, of having record immigration, the highest taxes for 70 years. Yeah. And to me, the Conservative Party has not done enough soul-searching about how on earth we allowed that to happen. Yeah.
And that's what, to me, unless we're able to explain that to the public, why on earth would they give Conservatives a second chance? And people would say, of course, you were part of some of those Cabinet meetings or some Cabinets before you were Prime Minister and you had some very senior roles. What were you doing to try and change that? Because they'll say, well, hang on, surely you were, you were in charge or you were in, in charge of departments. Did you find it particularly difficult I was to get anything done? I, I did. You know, I, I was fighting lots of battles. I fought battles to get trade deals done, like the Australia deal, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I fought a battle on self-ID. You know, I was the minister who stopped the bill, which would have made it possible for men to say they were women without any medical checks. Right. But I had a massive battle inside the Conservative Party about that. So what what has happened is too much of the Conservative Party were had adopted the left's beliefs because they thought that was the best way of getting on. So Conservatives in the Conservative Party spend a hell of a lot of time in government fighting to get some quite mm. basic stuff through. I mean, who'd have thought we were arguing? That a, what a man or a woman was. Yes. Who'd have thought we'd rather? Well, you might say stuff. the Tories were captured in a way, weren't they, by the kind of the, the wets, if you like, or what they used to be called. Well, the, the Tories. Wets. The t there were too many people in the Conservative Party who cared more about being in with the liberal elite, you know, being popular at dinner parties, yeah. getting a good corporate job after they left office, working on net zero or whatever other, you know job was popular in corporate circles. They were more concerned about that than they were about actually delivering for the public and that was a huge problem yeah, for us. absolutely. Finally, Donald Trump, um, less, than, well, less than a week to go now uh, until uh, you spend a lot of time in America, I know. Um, I think he's going to win. What do you think? I, I believe he's going to win. I hope and pray he is going to win. He is part of turning around the problems we have in the West. Because all the things we've been talking about that have infected Britain and are pushing our country in a direction of decline, they have the same problems in America. The same ideology, the woke gender ideology, the Keynesian economics, where, you know, Biden is spending like there's no tomorrow. We've got a problem with debt, but so have the Americans. And that all needs to be turned around. And I think Donald Trump is the man who can take on the system in America. And that's what needs to be taken on. It's not just a debate between left and right, they have a problem with the system too, and he will take them on. Mm. Liz Truss, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mike. Good to see you. Uh